Therapy with Penny Queen. Today I have Eric Appleman with Adura Clean Technologies, and we're going to go over a lot of the news that has just dropped this morning for Adura, and also cover a lot of the client engagement programs that are currently going on. So Eric, welcome back. Thank you. My honor. All right. So first things first, we have a really big news release this morning. Can you yeah. give everybody an idea of what cross-link polymers are and why that's important? Yeah, oh, thank you. Yes, cross-link polymers are polymers, uh, plastics that you, we all know around, but they cannot melt anymore. Uh, you sometimes call them thermosets. And we the cross-linking is done to give them special strength. Uh, but it comes with a problem if you would like to repurpose those polymers because you cannot melt them, as I said. And that means that for any meaningful conversion is pretty much very, very difficult to say the least. Uh, the best example we all know from our daily life around us is car tires. They, of course, must be very strong. They are cross linked polymers with a lot of other stuff in there. Yeah? But the only way to sort of do something with them after they're done is to, yeah, to, 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 burn them apart almost and try to recover the valuable fillers that you have in there basically junking all the good rubber that is in there now, that is an example uh, what we have been looking at is applying our technology on precisely those cross-linked materials and a little bit to our surprise a few years back we found that we could readily deconstruct those polymers and that suddenly opens up an entirely new opportunity for us to, to tackle precisely those very stubborn waste streams and turn them into something that we can bring back to useful uh, polymers and plastics or whatever else you have. Um, we actually got an engagement with a smaller party somewhere in Europe who had a cross-linked polymer uh, side stream. Um, we did that work and that is what we publicize about. But I said it opens the door to many applications, especially in that elastomer domain that I just mentioned. Not that it is a gun thing here, eh, because these things are very, very complicated. We all know there is steel in tires and, and fillers and everything else. Eh, but it is a, a breakthrough that you can actually turn also that, that the rubber part into something meaningful. And that's why we were very proud to announce this. All right. So uh, breaking it down further. Uh, so car tires is a massive problem. I mean, yeah. I, it, I feel like every year there's a, a big fire at a car tire graveyard. I don't, I'll, I'll see if I can find a picture to put it up for somebody, but these are massive because we've been producing car tires at a huge, yeah. at a huge speed with, with no real way of, you know, destroying them. I think sometimes I shred yeah. it and make it part of like children's playgrounds, which, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, not, not great material, but um, will you be able to recover carbon black? Well, th that is one, and that is actually very tricky. And that is not something that we routinely do in our other lines of business. Uh, our excitement is about the ability to recover what is between the carbon black, which is the elastomer, which is the polymer. And yeah, and, and, and that will take, of course, effort. But if you then can combine both, you recover both in the future, the carbon black and that rubber material, then, of course, the value pool goes up a lot. And, and it is just that we are opening this door. Eh? And I'm, I'm not going to say next next quarter we're going to have the solution <laughs> for, for car tires. But it opens a very valuable door. And, and we can do that whole process at relatively mild conditions, retain as much of the carbon as, as, as we as possible. And yeah, that, that, that is more revenue and less waste and less stuff to be burned and less emissions and all that that comes with that. That's very exciting. Uh, so I wasn't, I was surprised this morning when I saw this, when I saw this news release, but it was yields up to 84%. So this is, this is really big and it's yeah. a whole new vertical. Yeah, it is. And then the 84% is, of course, talking about that rubber fraction. Eh? And because, you know, there's also steel cords in there. We are not that much into that business, of course. Yeah, although although the steel can be melted down into ingots yeah. and there's a and there's yeah. a, a market for that right there. So uh, very that's very exciting. I know that it's a Duro's process to not put money into testing of anything unless there's a client there that is engaging and paying for it. So. Yeah. I, I was excited when I when I saw the, uh, yeah. the construction client, but I wasn't exactly sure what to make of it. So really yeah. nice to see and to get news that quickly on it. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure. All right. So we got a lot of questions from uh, investors, but the things I wanted to talk about 
I know at the beginning of the year, you said that your goals uh, were customer engagement, they were um, patent acquisition and technology development. So let's, I'd like to, to get into that and, and talk a little more about, you know, about all the customer engagement that's, that's been going on and give people an yeah. idea of where that's going or what the process is like. Yeah. No, thank you very much. And see, that, those are the three things that we made our spearheads for this year. Um, talking customer engagement, well, actually, the, the press release that you just brought up it started with the customer engagement. And for us, as a small and not so well-known company, these customer engagements are tremendously important, um, especially because we are operating in a very dynamic market. And you see situations where people find new ways to deal with waste, uh, they sort it in a different way, uh, the applications develop, and it is really crucial to stay on top of what is happening. And uh, as much as we, we do the engagement also for all sorts of technical reasons, before all there are a window on the world. Uh, we are talking with the largest petrochemical companies in the world, but we are also talking with large waste management companies. And we are talking with people that use, uh, there was a press release a little bit earlier, where we talked about uh, our work with a consumer goods company that had a particular stubborn kind of plastic packaging material uh, and where we could say, hey, that is interesting, you have a problem, we might have a solution. And that's what we're working on. So for us, this window of the world thing is enormously important and it, it continues. And you just talked about these thermosets. I've actually been approached by people who do make tires who make elastomer goods and they say if you could help us and then of course we have to be be wise because in the end of the day we do not want to keep ourselves busy with a, a hodgepodge of assignments and we take a very structured approach to that if we're working with a customer we do that because that customer of course wants to get something out of it he wants to know whether we can help him solve his problem but it shall also support our development so it is actually very much integrated with our technical development effort and to make sure that when we do an engagement, we also learn something that we want to know. And that is very, very important. And apart from the market intelligence, that is also a technical point. It is, as I said, very, very much going forward very quickly. Uh, and you see an interesting pattern. Uh, if a customer comes very typically, he'll say, can you give me some information or maybe do a, a small trial to prove your to demonstrate your point, which we then do. Uh, and then you typically get a smaller engagement where yeah, three months of work and then, then he sends his own particular waste and we cook that to pieces. And then you see the next step is where you then go into an, an engagement that can actually take on a year or something. Of course, comes with all sorts of uh, NDAs and negotiations and contracts and everything else. For painfully slow sometimes. Uh, but very understandably so. Uh, and then you typically uh, go to the next stage where you have a, a collaboration that can well last well over a year and where, which is obviously a sign of big interest on behalf of the customer. And that process, and that is what we are doing on multiple fronts, multiple applications. As well. So Eric, next thing I'd like to ask you about is yeah. the Shell Game Changer program and where, yeah. where the progress is there. Yeah. Well, um, maybe it is good to 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 share what the Game Changer program is actually about. It it is a way for Shell to quickly investigate promising new technologies, and as they sometimes call it themselves, uh, the mission is to fail quick. Um, we are now in them for a year, and we have a tremendous dialogue. And and the good news is actually we haven't failed yet. Uh, and of course, the program is not something that lasts uh, five years or something. And uh, we are probably closer to the end than to the beginning for, uh, for that phase. But still, the dialogue is going on. We are learning a tremendous lot from Shell with its depth in petrochemistry and equipment and process design. And at the same time, uh, we continue to interest them with what we have to offer. And so, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to conclude that one successfully. 
and 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 actually not fail, have, having failed to fail at the very end of the day. Perfect. I I know I've heard. I have a friend that worked with that program years years yeah. ago. It was before Adoro's engagement, but yeah. I was basically told that you know those first few phases are to wipe companies out of it. Like it's it's yeah. meant for them to fail, and yeah. um, you know when. As soon as I heard you're through phase three, I, I got very, very excited. Um, the one thing I know this comes up a lot in, in conversations with, with, um, other retail investors and, you know, people want, people want to see it move and want to see it, want to see it completed, but nobody seems to really understand just how massive shell is and how slow an organization is like that to to make these big decisions so yeah we i i think i'll speak for all of us in retail that we cannot wait uh we see this as being a a well appropriately named game changer for the company so yeah yeah i'm excited but i'd rather you do it right than do it quickly so yeah and we are well past that stage three. I will not tell you where we are, yeah, but it is uh, it, it is a very exciting and very important thing to do. And it's, it is not for nothing that these companies are so tremendously successful and they yeah. do things right. They take their time because those decisions are big. So can you can you touch on the planning and and development for R3? What if have there been any, any changes there? What's the plan currently looking like? Now, at this moment, I, I would say we are still working on it with, with, with a lot of emphasis. It is going according to plan. Uh, you need to take um, important decisions. If you just look in general to people that, that process waste, uh, you see that that whole technology development takes a long period of time. Uh, at this moment, I do see no reason why we will not be able to uh, to stick to our planning. Um, things are just progressing. We have no strange surprises. Uh, the most <laughs> important thing, and I think that is also what I want to give to the audience, uh, we are dealing with waste. And, and I actually saw recently on a conference uh, a colleague who was promoting another technology and he just sort of sighed like yeah, it is waste and there's something new every day. That's what it is. We knew that yeah, compared it to crude oil refining, yeah, where, which also spans an enormous variety of things, well, this variety is probably even bigger. And um, so that is where, of course, you must deal with. And um, having said that, uh, this is also an area where it becomes increasingly clear to me that Adura has an edge uh, and and without naming any people in particular I have in my interactions with customers and, and other sources I hear concern that some of these waste recycling technologies um, are just too cumbersome and expensive and, and to give you a little bit of a dollar perspective on it eh, if you're really lucky, you would get your waste for free, but then it has to be hauled and it has to be sorted and it maybe has to be washed and you make a little bit of wastewater, all that sort of thing. And then, yeah, at this moment, we have some niche markets for recycled waste, but in the long run, we are up against base petrochemicals. Uh, petrochemical feedstock is typically about $600 a ton. And it means that you have $600 to play with between taking in the waste and turning something out as a product. And what you now see is that many of the other technologies uh, rely on removal of a lot of stuff that is not going to get anywhere. Uh, and even then, so there's excessive pretreatment, which also means losses. That stuff is not going to be recycled. And at the same time, at the very end, then the quality is still not pure enough and a very comprehensive after treatment needs to be done. And then I hear more and more from, from the petrochemical scene that people are concerned that the traditional technologies like pyrolysis are not able to bear their cost. The good thing about ours is that we do have that much bigger tolerance for contaminations up front. And that what comes out of our primary process is pretty much clean stuff. It does not contain 
many of the constituents that were in the old plastic waste that you do not want because very elegantly they are sort of channeled out through the side door. Now, this is a tremendous advantage and it is suddenly very clear and you hear it, and you know, I don't know how you know it, but in the industry then suddenly you hear it from five times at the same moment that there is something brewing there. And that gives me tremendous confidence. We had from day one realized that that was our edge. And even though we started like a lot later than all the others, sooner or later it would come to the forefront. I think that's what we're seeing. So I know, you know, looking at the engagements that you've added on this year, yep. I, I know the, you know, the consumer packaging, you know, we're, yep. we're talking multi-layer there, right? Yeah. Like that, that, so the, the holy grail of plastics recycling is being able to handle plastics that are more contaminated yeah. or that are mixed with you know, multiple layers or, or yeah. you know, I mean, you can call it a contaminant, I guess, but if it's just a different type of plastic, that's where, you know, I, I know there's these brute force like pyrolysis anybody can burn things and you're going to get a lot of char yeah right? that's that's a pyrolysis is a one size fits all kind of solution where the yeah. end product is is it's not great so going through that's important to me to be able to you know expand what what's capable what you know what the capabilities are of of a of a plant a unit but i guess my question is is this something that if you were to create a commercial size plant would it be tunable and so you could set it for different types of of feedstock or would they be being set up for one one type you could actually go either way and uh, okay. maybe come back to that ultimate example of the multi-layer plastics. Um, why do we use multi-layers? <laughs> well, one reason is that you want to have a plastic to be a good barrier for moisture and then for oxygen and then maybe for UV light. I, ju I just name a few examples. You want to print your logo on it. And that is all these properties are not available from one plastic. So we have inc incredibly sophisticated machines that, that pile tiny layers on top of each other. And some of that are the polyethylene or the polypropylene, which most of us know. Uh, and that is actually very good to, as a moisture barrier, but it's not very good for carbon dioxide and it's not very good for oxygen. So you add another one. And one material that you, for instance, find there is nylon. It's just an example. Uh, nylon is a good oxygen barrier, uh, but nylon itself contains nitrogen and oxygen atoms. Now, you do not want to have those in the hydrocarbon product that we are going to sell to the chemical industry. So what do you do? Well, you cannot sort them out because they are one piece. <laughs> you cannot pull them apart. Uh, very tedious work. Um, the other thing you can do is then say, okay, I'll accept in my pyrolysis technology that I burn all those atoms into my oil. And so I end up in nitrogen and oxygen in my oil. And then I'll have to treat it. And that is done by hydrogenation steps. You can forget about the technology, but believe me, it's expensive. Yeah. Uh, because it's another factory. And by the way, if you do hydrogenation, you need hydrogen. So you need a hydrogen factory as well. So you need three factories instead of one. So that is really making difficult. In our process, we also break down that nylon, but we break it down into pieces that can be very easily separated. And then you get that clean. So what you could do is you could say, well, if I have a pure stream of that, I'll even recover that. But more often than not, you will, of course, have a mix with everything. And there's maybe 1% nylon and you might not bother about it. So you could see a situation where you say, I build a multipurpose plant where I can take everything. And then it would be pretty indiscriminate. And you just have to manage the daily fluctuations that you get from the household waste streams. In some special situations, if you would be able to put your hand on a, a stream that was only that stuff, you might even try to recover what, what your side stream is. 
So there's, there's, there's various options to turn that into working processes, but the underlying principle of our process remains the same. We had that example of your rubber. If you have an enormous amount of carbon black, yeah, you have to deal with that. That will mean that you have a different kind of plant. But the principle is the same. Okay. All right. So if I'm a major corporation and I have one problem, the plant's going to be set up for that one problem. But maybe yeah. if I'm a municipal waste facility, I'm going to run things in, in, a, in batches or... I'm going to handle it, yeah. handle it separately. Okay. A very interesting question whether waste management companies would actually go there eh? or whether it's going to be a centralized thing. And eh? those, those are actually questions that's still being fleshed out by the industry. Who's actually going to do this? Yeah. Okay. So. All right. So I'm looking, I've got a lot of, a lot of questions here, but yeah. there is a lot of, a lot of overlap. And I will say a lot of these, I think probably need to, uh, need to go to i think probably a lot of these need to be answered by by ofer but let me just go with are the r2 tests as good as expected yeah i i, I cannot give too many details uh, we're working with the machine every day and we're getting results out so it's just working all right um do you have to deal with any unforeseen obstacles well, as said, we're working with waste. You have a new, newly designed thing. It's called commissioning. And yeah, you come in across things. Uh, but there is nothing that is that is actually unexpected or, or unsolvable. Okay. So I'll, let me let me ask this one then. Where do you stand with respect to the tests for the six companies that have entered the customer engagement program? Early, mid, or late stage is is really the question. Yeah, it depends what you call early, mid, or late stage. Uh, we are working on all of them, and actually one, one, one or two more. Um, and yeah, with some, we, as I said, we agree to do a reconnaissance program, and that goes well. Um, we are now in a stage that some of them want to contemplate longer collaborations. So uh, I, I think I'd prefer to stick with that. I can just say that the, being accountable for that program myself, I'm very excited and impressed by how well it goes. It's a bit of a unique model uh, to go to customers that early. Uh, I think it's very successful. Uh, I've actually done it in my own career in different companies, and this is the way to get ahead with this kind of complicated innovations. Okay. Yeah, I the the general vibe that I'm that I'm getting from the the other investors, you know, I I'm in, I have my own discord and I, I talk on a lot of the, the different, uh, different forums. And, and I know that, um, a lot of people are, they, they see that we have an engagement and I, I think they expect that to have some final answer on them very quickly. And I think that's something that would be really good to really good to talk about because they see, you know, I, I know the goal, one of the main goals was adding customers. Yeah. Right. And I think you've been knocking that out of the park. I mean, what is this? I, is it six so, multi-billion dollar clients? Oh, oh and, and it is more now. Huh? Um, the problem is, of course, of the problem. <laughs> and this is very close to their strategic heart as well. And that is also why this is not something to publish uh, on, on, on the front pages of the newspaper. Uh, this is this is very, very sensitive uh, because if people explore this, but you will actually know how they are looking at their sustainability strategies, their sourcing strategies, and that is why uh, these are complicated talks. Yeah, and, uh, and that is also why I unfortunately cannot scream it from the roofs that, hey, we have now finished that one, we finished that one, and we're going to go continue with others. I, I hope you can appreciate that. No, oh, I definitely can. And as yeah. you know, I've, I've been you know, and it, a Duro investor since the, the IPO, right? I, I wasn't yeah. able to get in before, uh, but as soon as it started trading, I was able to buy. Yeah. And yeah. and I, I know that this is a, a slow moving, you know, you're working with slow moving large companies, but this is also, you know, the, the learning is happening at the same yeah. time as you know commercialization isn't you know throwing a switch so 
and the confidentiality yeah? Yeah, because you see how many companies for understandable reasons actually do not even want you to mention their name and because they show their hand in what strategy you have chosen and that is that is sometimes unfortunate on the other side it is understandable fortunately we get a lot of good things back yeah, but that is also why we cannot always give all the detail well also as the let's say the little fish in the equation i i know that aduro doesn't get to you know command these companies to to do things or you're going to put out a press <laughs> yeah, release yeah. today about this I, yeah. It would be great. It would be great if you if you could. But the the other thing that I want to make sure that people are realizing is that we're really only dealing with one unit on the plastic side, right? I mean, there's there's the the bitumen yeah. as well. But I mean, every time we're talking about these plastics, we're talking about running that on one machine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we had a fleet of them and a fleet yeah. of of chemists, that would be great. But I don't, I mean, you'd have to tell me, would we have results faster? I mean, if the companies get their data and then they, and then they start to, to figure it out. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of people were expecting that they would get a major contract out of one of these by this time. And yeah. You know that would be that would be thrilling, but yeah. it, it's not something that I expect in the in the next you know little bit here. I mean, yeah, and I have, if you're talking like a collaboration on the one year scale, I think you we promised that there would be one or two coming this year. And I'm very optimistic about that. If that's what you call the big contract, it's going to be there. That yeah. is to me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if if it is like building a one billion dollar plant, that may probably take a bit longer. <laughs> yeah, is, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, plans for R three. How how is that process going? As I said, that is that is our third uh, trust. Huh? It is about uh, technology development. Um, it is, it is on schedule. Yeah, I, I, I cannot say too much of it because then again, you are into the intellectual property domain, but I have no reason to believe that we will deviate from anything that we have said before. Uh, we are uh, we are selecting our technology. We will then design the, uh, the pilot situation where that one fits in. So yeah, okay. not much to say, well, much to say, but not much to give away. That's what I have here. What does the customer engagement program look like as i said what, what you find in in these very large corporations because that's what we deal with but also it's smaller by the way it is not only that and um, they have they're basic on a on like a, a roulette table they have to pay their chips with good and promising technologies uh, in what is going to be a competitive field it is different on different parts of the world uh, but for instance the petrochemical companies have to face situations where they will be asked to have renewable products and they have to find the right technologies. Um, if you, you have been in the petrochemical industry like myself, you know that that is an incredibly high stakes game. And, uh, and it is, by the way, happening at the moment that the field is more in flux than ever because this industry has basically done the same for the past 100 years with little additional bolt-on inventions all the way. And now suddenly, next to that good old crude oil track, you have to do something new. And that is completely, that is high risk. And what you see there is a behavior that we've seen before in, in the medical sector where large companies who are especially very good at doing tomorrow the same as yesterday with a little improvement, the breakthrough innovation is outsourced. So the discovery of new medications is, has already been for years the domain of small startup companies who bring it to a certain stage and they are then in the portfolio of followed subjects of a pharmaceutical company and at the right moment they're bought up. I think we are seeing the same here. We, there are many numbers on the roulette table. There's many things to choose from. Uh, large corporations are usually not optimal in, in betting on 50 horses. <laughs> uh, so they are actually looking outside. They support those companies. They're willing to support. Um, 
but then they will actually step in themselves at a later stage. And I think well, they, they look around and it is, it is amazing if you talk to them and say, yeah, we have been reviewing a hundred startup dossiers in the last couple of years. That is very typical. And then they pick one or two. And, uh, or we make an approach and we pitch and say, well, this is what we're looking for. And, and you, you pitch and that's how it goes. So they are really extremely powerful and competent to identify technologies and to help them bring forward. But their biggest challenge is, of course, to pick out the right cherries, to not miss anything. And at the same time, of course, keep the, the current business under control. So that is how they must be looking at Hadoop. And there are companies like Lux Research is one, and they, they're monitoring all the startups in our field. And, and that is tools that they use. And they sell the subscriptions to the big multinationals for that. Okay. Yeah, it's it's that... portfolio management. That's maybe a good description. Portfolio of options. Yeah. I've, so I've looked at a lot of, you know, Shell's the only only company that we have that that is truly named in yeah. here. I I definitely have my guesses as to who the other ones are, and I won't I won't bring it up. But I look at their track records with R and D in these areas, and Shell's pretty easy because you can look back and you can see companies that were in the Game Changer program. I've yeah. I'm I'm doing a big big project where I'm, I'm researching all these different plastic recycling technologies and companies, just trying to figure out um, what, where they're strongest, who's, who's looked at them and things like that. Yeah. And while doing that, I've seen a lot of technologies that did end up getting investment from some of these large, larger groups. Yeah. And, um, you know, a lot of these companies were never public, though, so it makes it a lot harder. And definitely, yep. when you're a random person who calls and yep. calls and you're an investor in another company, yep. you do have information. They're they're not they don't really like that as much. No, it it is very difficult to get a total overview of this scene, and uh, because there are so many, as you say, many are not public, and there are these databases that you can subscribe to, but they are pretty specialized. Uh, so yeah, I understand the the conundrum, and and it is for us also important for that reason that we can show to you that that we draw the interest. Yeah, well, the amount of of companies that have engaged over the last year is is phenomenal. So yeah, yeah. I'm excited to see to see where that where that leads, and clearly. Um, this is we're progressing forward there's been a lot of really exciting things happening in the plastic world uh yeah. lately with treaties being written and i know yeah. that you've gotten to do some good demonstrations for other companies can you just talk about that all together where let's start with the plastic industry and and the treaties that have been that are being written and the the changes that's coming yeah, there are, it is a very complicated world and uh, there is a United Nations initiative um, that is still under negotiation. The last round just closed up, I think one or two weeks ago in Ottawa. There's going to be a concluding round in South Korea later this year, I believe. And you see that the world is moving forward to ways um, to deal with plastics. There have been very aggressive pushes to just ban plastic or have it reduced that is not tolerated uh, by other countries so there's a lot of complicated negotiations and where it precisely will end up is very hard to say from here one very important thing is that extended producer responsibility will be an important instrument which means that everybody who puts plastic in the market as a packaging material or as something else uh, has to pay to deal with it and that is a very important one. We have it actually in the Netherlands, my own country. Everybody who puts a bit of a ton of plastic out in the market, I think has to pay a thousand euros. And mm -hmm. with those thousand euros, that goes to some sort of an NGO-like organization. They will make sure that it is collected and they will try to make as much money with it as possible. D now, you can imagine if you have to pay a thousand dollars, 
And if you could reduce that bill by helping companies to find, to implement good reuse, there is a bit of an incentive there. Yeah, because you're sort of, it is, it's, a, it's a huge tax. And that seems to be coming along in many different places. So yeah. for a ton of plastic, yeah. their fees are close to a thousand, a thousand euros. euros? Yeah. Yeah, and a dollar a kilo. And so if you're putting shampoo in the market in plastic bottles, for every ton of bottle, you're going to pay a thousand dollars. Wow. And that is to make sure that you can collect it separately, that you can process separately. And those, this, this seems to be one of the most powerful instruments. And as I said, for us, it is fantastic news because it means that there is a big incentive to create value out of that stream. Wow. Yeah, I so I, I understand extended producer responsibility, but I've never heard actual numbers applied to it. Yeah. That yeah. that is massive. Um, yeah. Very very exciting there. So yeah, that is one of the big things that is uh, that is happening in the in the world at this moment in time, and that is actually more on the use side than anything else. Uh, another thing in Europe at this moment there is. Um, legislation or regulation coming about the minimal recycled content and that will create a market for recycled plastics and that is another way to stimulate this and um, at the same time of course at this moment virgin plastics are extremely cheap so that puts pressure on the market it's a very dynamic place out there and sometimes you have to choose which ones you will follow and which ones not, and which are temporary and, and which are permanent. And that's, uh, that's what you see at the moment. Well, Eric, what else do you want Aduro investors to, to understand about this process and how things are changing? Now, I, I think the most important thing at this moment is that you see that a realism is descending in the market where people say, Circular futures are not paid only by good intentions, they are also paid by dollars. Uh, it is becoming very important to find solutions for plastic revaluation or revalorization or whatever we call it, that can be paid for. That is where our strength is and we are delighted to see that uh, because it, it is a fact that many of these technologies are inherently expensive and which means that you also if you do a lot of learning curve and a lot of optimization you will still have a challenging situation i think that is the most important thing that i have learned in the past three months and that that people start to become realistic about that and demanding at the same time and then we are in a really good position because we are so much better at taking less valuable input and creating more pure output Oh, I'm, I, I do have to say that, you know, I, I got to interview you when you first joined the company and uh, I was really excited just first off by the nature of your position. Yeah. Right? When you said that you were talking about adding clients and it's definitely happened. So, yeah. I mean, we've, yeah. this has been a, a massive year for the company and yeah. I'm really excited to hear to hear more, I'm excited to for a collaboration, to 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 really to really happen, and then to get to R three. These are these are are the things on on my list, yeah. and and I yeah. I think anyone who who listens, who's listened to me in the past, uh, knows that I'm a, I'm long a duro. You know, I've yeah. been I've continued to add, and of course. Um, you know, again, as a reminder, Aduro does not pay me. I'm an investor. Nope. I'm nope. talking my book here. So I wish that all of these processes were a lot faster. I bet yeah. I bet you guys wish that more than I do because uh, I know it's your your day to day lives. And, and while, yeah. while I think about the company a lot, it is definitely not my my day to day. No, it is. It is not like developing an app. Yeah, it is. Uh, if you are in, uh, I, I have of course been in this industry for long, and all the steps you have to take. It, it, it is. It is sometimes painfully slow. It's another dynamic. But yeah, that is that is what it is. We better. And and I think I also could help to bring that realism to the company. Same time, and when I was at Brightlands, 
And I brought in 50 plus startups, many of them in plastic recycling. And this is the one that I believed in. I could have hung in in Brightlands for another five years until my retirement and have a relatively easy half government sort of job. I said, oh, this, these guys have it. This is, this is something else. And yeah. As such, yeah, I'm paid for it now, but <laughs> I'm, I'm also, uh, the, the reward is more than that for me. So good. Good. Yeah. I'm excited. I mean, it's nice to, it's nice to see that like social sentiment from everyone else. I'm not talking about our investors or people who yeah. are, who are in this industry, but the rest of the world is coming on board with yeah. plastics are a problem. And the only way we're going to deal with it is by actual, actual regulation, actually making producers responsible because that's, I mean, that's the only way, it's the only way you can do it. So if the, the, the winds are, are changing in our direction yeah. as, you know, the, the technology gets, gets proven out. So. Yeah. It, it, somebody has to pay the real cost of bringing plastics in the environment. There's a real value to eh? plastics are magic materials, but we do have to take care of the tail end that is happening now. And um, there are excellent technologies out there. They, of course, do not stand on 100 years of learning curve as other technologies. They will need their time uh, and um, it will have and, and the best ones will win. And that's that's basically what it is. All right. Well, perfect. Anything else you want to say? No, that is what I want to say.